Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Atheist Experience for Sunday, November 13th, 2005. I'm Matt Delaney, filling in this week for Russell Glasser, and joining me this week is Tim Sudo. Hi. <laughs> um, the Atheist Experience is a live call-in program airing every Sunday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. It rebroadcasts on Tuesdays in the same time slot, but isn't live, so you won't see a number and don't call. Uh, we'll be posting the telephone number shortly, but we got a few announcements and news items to get out of the way first. Um, this show is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We have weekly meetings, and currently those weekly meetings are being held at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road, beginning at 11.30 every Sunday, except for the third Sunday of the month, when we host a lecture series at the Austin History Center. The Austin History Center is located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe, and the lectures begin at 12.30. Um, there will be a lecture next Sunday, as it is the third Sunday of the month. Um, you do not have to be a member. Uh, all, week, all the weekly meetings and the lectures are open to any atheist or atheist-friendly people. In addition to this program, the ACA also sponsors an internet audio program called The Nonprofits. You can listen to the program every Saturday at 2 p.m. Uh, Central on, at www.freethoughtradio.com. The program is hosted by Jeff D. and Dennis Lubay, produced by Russell Glasser, and from time to time I participate as well. We broadcast live every other Saturday, um, but if you listen each week, you'll be able to catch up on any of the programs that you might have missed. Um, additionally, an archive of previous episodes and information on receiving new episodes via podcasting is available at www.nonprofitsradio.com. In addition to the monthly lectures, weekly meetings, television, and internet audio programs, we also sponsor a number of social events throughout the week. On Monday nights, we have Godless Gamers uh, at the home of Russell Glasser. We play a variety of popular board games and card games. Um, some are competitive, some are cooperative, some are just fun. If you enjoy a good game, visiting with friends, you're welcome to attend. Godless Gamers begins at 7 p.m. every Monday. You can visit the ACA website or email tv at atheist-community.org for contact information and directions. On Tuesday nights, we have a brand new event. We're going to be evaluating Newton's laws of motion and Galileo's law of falling bodies by strapping wheels on our feet and trying to navigate around a large concrete surface. Um, most people would just call that roller skating. So there's a lot of ACA members who have, have taken this up, and Tuesday night happens to be adult night at Playland Skating Rink, and we'll be there. Um, the doors open at 7 p.m. and last till 10.30. Uh, any atheist, atheist-friendly people welcome to join us, and don't worry too much about falling down, because I'm sure I do it enough myself. Uh, Playland Skating Rink is located near the corner of 183 and Burnett Road, behind the Nissan dealer off of McCann Road. Um, uh, also on Thursdays, we host Atheist Happy Hour at Antonio's Tex-Mex, which is located on the southbound feeder road of I-35, just south of 183. Uh, feel free to join us beginning at 7.30 for drinks, discussion, dinner if you want. Information on all these events can be found at our website, www.atheist-community.org, or you can email tv to atheist-community.org as well. And finally, the cast and crew of the TV show normally gets together for dinner after the program. The program ends at 6 o'clock. We normally arrive between 6.30 and 6.45, and today we'll once again be going to Fresh Choice on Great Hills Trail near the Arboretum. Um, next week, we will, be, we will not be going to Fresh Choice. We'll be going to the Mon Mongolian Barbecue downtown, um, and we'll have more information in the address on that next week. As with all of our activities, there are no membership requirements for attendance. Any atheist-friendly atheist people are invited to attend. The events are a great opportunity to meet other members of the ACA, meet the cast and crew of this show after uh, for the, the dinner this evening. If you're planning to attend one of these events to preach, pester, or proselytize, don't bother. Just pick up the phone as soon as we put the number up and give us a call, or you can email as well. Um, that's what the program's for. If you have things you'd like to discuss, if you'd like to tell us about your beliefs or why you think you're right and we're wrong or, or anything like that, that's what the program's for. So we'll post the, few, the telephone number in just a few minutes, but uh, having said that, we've got Tim joining us here this week, and you're going to talk about... Blue Laws. Blue Laws. Blue Laws. Yeah, a lot of times on this show and uh, throughout the atheist uh, community, we talk about some of the big issues uh, with uh, separation of church and state. You always hear about the Ten Commandments and uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and I wanted to talk about Blue Laws, which are a way that... Um, separation of church and state in a negative way affects more people than 
via is publicized, most people realize. Separation of church and state isn't just about Ten Commandments or the Pledge. It's about when, with laws which are out there for the public good. They should be for the good of everyone. There are um, secular reasons why a law is good. There's a good for all of civilization when you make a law. But if you make a law just to reinforce your religious belief, saying, hey, me and all my religious friends, we do this, maybe if you made a law so that other people would join us too or would have to do the same as we do, that would be good. No, that's not good. What we need is laws that are just based on the merit of their idea, not where they come from. And blue laws are specifically laws that are designed around religion. Uh, they originated with uh, the old Puritans of the Northeast and uh, New England states and mostly had to do with uh, doing certain activities on Sunday to keep the day, the Sabbath, holy. And, um, but blue laws still exist, especially here in Pennsylvania, and their effects uh, creep out throughout the week. And, uh, an example of that, how it affects me, is I, I, ch I have a job, and you know, it's my choice, but I work late. And uh, it makes sense for me to purchase my groceries after I work. And that's often after midnight. Uh, getting out of work just about midnight. So what I have to do is, if I want to purchase some beer, which I like to have with dinner because I don't drink Coke or any of that, I have to sprint my car down and go and run into the HUB or whatever, usually HBB, if I want to get my groceries. And if I'm late after midnight, I can't purchase my beer. And that makes me sad. But, and other people can't purchase beer. There's no reason why I shouldn't be able to. There are other establishments called bars that are purchasing the beer, uh, that where you can purchase beer after midnight. And the... Um, you know, you can just walk down the aisle and grab it in six. No one at the HEB has to do any extra effort for me. I'm doing all the work for them. But for some reason, I can't get it, and that's because of blue laws. There are many ways that this affects us. It affects us in, uh, uh, with purchase of alcohol. Also that in Texas, uh, there's a lot of restrictions on the use of sex toys. In Pennsylvania, there's a lot of restrictions that you can't buy alcohol at all on Sunday. And um, you uh, have to buy beer in one place and liquor in another. And um, if you search around your life, you're going to find, if you think about it, ways in which these laws affect you. Every state is different and every locale is different. But what it comes down to is for religious reasons, people are, ma are making laws that affect um, all of us when they shouldn't. So, and uh, just as a note, because we all love football in Texas, there's exceptions to the liquor laws that you can make an amendment to the rule if there's a football game going on. So there's rules about what time you can purchase, fo uh, purchase alcohol before, uh, you can't purchase before a certain time on Sunday. But if there's a football game going on, they make an exception to that rule, typical Texas style. So, you know, so if you don't care about the separation of church and, uh, in church and state as it relates to uh, you know, the Ten Commandments or the saying under God on, uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance because you don't go to school anymore, that's fine. But with, all, with that in mind, think about your desire to drink and how it affects you there. HEB should have the right, and any business should have the right to sell alcohol to responsible adults at any time. And religion shouldn't get in the way of that. And I should be able to have a beer with dinner if I have a late night at work. Yeah, that's a lot of this. You know, a lot of the, the blue law type things with regard to uh, Sabbath laws and working on the Sabbath. The, the The larger point is that everybody seems to have well, a lot the religions who do have these these stipulations about working or not working on the Sabbath or what you can and can't do. Um, well, they have different Sabbath days, so. Because we live in a country which is primarily Christian, a lot of these laws tend to go and affect Sunday, or used to, and then they change to affect time slots on different days. And the important thing is, is that if, if it's important to you, if it's important to your religious observation that you don't uh, work, shop, eat, drink during a specific span of time, don't do it. Making a law that prohibits everybody else from doing it just because it disagrees with your religion um, is wrong.
it's it's a violation of the separation of church and state. And the thing that a lot of, of people, especially Christians, and, and I'm not picking on them for any reason other than they're in the majority and often behind a, fl- a lot of uh, legislation like this, um, they never stop to consider uh, what would happen if somebody else had the majority. If, so, if let's say, you weren't allowed to shop on Friday or uh, Saturday. You know, if, what if what if the laws were completely uh, biased towards somebody else's arbitrary religious beliefs um, and diminish your ability to enjoy life? Um, if there's something that your religion prohibits you from doing, don't do it. You know, <laughs> to me, it's pretty much that simple. Yeah, if, if uh, barbers were in charge, barbers take Tuesdays off and work on Saturdays. If barbers were in charge, you wouldn't be able to have work or anything on Tuesday. And, uh, but they choose to do that. They don't enforce that on anyone else. So I approve of that. Uh, let's, uh, you want to go ahead and head no, on to some calls? calls? Let's have some fun. Last week we couldn't get all our lines open, and this time we will. Yeah, we're, evidently there was a problem last week where we only had one line available. Um, looks like we probably have all three available. The number's up right now. Um, you can go ahead and give us a call and, and talk about whatever you want. And on the off chance that we, oh, there's more calls lighting up, so it looks like we probably have three lines. Um, let's start off with Douglas. How are you doing? Uh, hey. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, atheism, like if you like really study atheism really hard, like a result of that is like hair loss. I, I can't hear you. You're kind of breaking up. A result of studying atheism really hard is hair loss and obesity. I... I I can't understand what he's saying. His phone's breaking up. Yeah. Maybe if you get a better phone, I don't, I don't know. The, the yeah. note that was on the prompter was with regard to, to modern-day atheism versus Christianity, but uh, I, I'd have to find out what you mean exactly by modern-day atheism, or maybe you also meant modern-day Christianity. Uh, well, yeah, get a better phone, call back. We'll be glad to talk to you again. Yeah, if, if, if you just wanted a, a, I don't know, a quick assessment of modern-day atheism versus modern-day Christianity, um, I'd say that there's a good case to be made that modern-day Christianity is a completely different creature from Christianity of the past, and that Christians today are just watered-down versions of, of Christians of old. Um, after all, you know, we had all these blue laws, like Tim was talking about, uh, in the United States, primarily because of Christianity, and nobody for a long period of time was allowed to, to shop or keep a shop open on Sunday. Um, and we did away with those because we realized this is a 24-7 culture that we've created. And in order to keep things running, you just can't stop. But we still haven't completely moved away from a lot of the, the arbitrary, you know, oh, you got to stop selling at midnight. And or you have the dry things. counties. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have, uh, someone's telling me about where uh, Texas Tech University is the, it's a dry county. But once you get out, there's a whole village of, you know, places to purchase alcohol and all the other, you know, you know, things that you're su- not supposed to purchase in that county. Well, if people from that county weren't purchasing those things, there wouldn't be a village on the other side of the border. And uh, that goes wherever you have a dry county, you have a little strip of people overcharging for alcohol just outside of town. And if people would just you know, fess up and say, hey, I really do purchase alcohol, let's have it in our town for convenience and we can actually charge a reasonable price, things would be a lot smoother. We don't need to you know, lie to ourselves. Just you know, do what you want to do. Be safe and responsible and go have a fun time without being mischievous and dis- deceptive. Now, in reality, there are uh, some good non-religious arguments for not selling alcohol at certain times and in certain fashions. The problem is, is that, in general, I, I kind of side with Tim, and I think that they, um, while they're you know, real reasons, um, there seem to be too many exceptions and too many... Um, extenuating circumstances surrounding it. You know, at the end, it, it, at the end of the day, it, it kind of works down to um, we already have 
punishments in place. And yes, I don't want to see people out drinking and driving and putting others in danger. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that's no more likely to happen at nine o'clock at night after they've been at the bar for a few hours than it is at three o'clock in the morning after they hit, you know, the convenience store. As a matter of fact, it's probably less likely because they can't actually drink at the convenience store. They would have to take it somewhere else and drink first. And you can just stockpile it. I mean, people are going, if somebody wants to get loaded, they're going to get loaded. And they're going to find a way, no matter whether or not you've got the store closed uh, at that particular time or not. So with that said, we'll go on to Frank. How you doing? Yes, hello. How you doing? Uh, I had a conversation. I wasn't sure what atheism is. Could you tell me? Yeah, um, atheism is the lack of belief in a god or a supreme being. Okay, are you against people that do believe in a god? Am I against them? What do you mean? Are, do, you, do you not like people that do believe in a god? I like plenty of people that believe in god. I have okay. family who are religious. Um, I, I respect their right to believe. The, the, the one thing that I don't uh, acknowledge or, or respect is the right for somebody to legislate their beliefs onto other people re regardless of their, their beliefs. Okay, fair enough. But my biggest problem, though, is atheism doesn't that lead to a, a slippery slope where you can be like, well, if I don't believe in a God, if there's no consequences after I die, I can do anything? You, there, there are people who could potentially go down a slippery slope like that. Well, but you have the reverse slippery slope for uh, people who do believe in the afterlife. They think, hey, I've got this afterlife. I can do whatever the hell I want now and not worry about the future of, of civilization. I mean, yeah, and, and, and there's also religious extremism that, that is, is also... That's, there's, yeah, a reason why, ways. there's a reason why slippery slope arguments are, are considered logical fallacies. Is it, is it against eight to masturbate? He masturbates? Well, he couldn't even keep a straight face on the phone. Maybe he was at the moment. Oh. I don't know. I know, you know, I know it's a good show, but you know, take a breath next time. <laughs> Mary, you're on the air. Hi, I just wanted to point out, it gets more ridiculous than dry counties. In Dallas, you have the phenomenon of the dry neighborhood. Really? Yeah, you can cross a street and all of a sudden be in dry territory, and it can drive you nuts. What if you're drinking on the street? Oh, well, then the sure. Dallas police beat you over the head. You just don't, you don't drink on the street. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, throughout North Texas and East Texas, have you ever heard of a unicard? No. Tell well, me about this. In dry territories, both in, within the city of Dallas and all over, you know, dry counties all over the place, instead of having to buy a membership in every single club so that you can buy a drink, you can buy this one card for like a dollar a year. And you just flash it at whatever joint you want to go to, and they have to serve you. So it's kind of it, they're they're kind of running a membership racket to get around the law, much that uh, the, exactly. new, the new smoking ban is going to end up being. Well, now wait a second. As, as a person who breathes oxygen, I'm in favor of the smoking ban. What? But I know uh, a lot of people who are in favor of it. I I happen to be opposed to it for the same reason I'm opposed to things like blue laws, because with, without an actual smoking ban. Any business can open and say, I am going to be a completely no-smoking business and draw in those customers that appreciate that type of atmosphere. And if a business wants to open and say, I'm going to be a smoking business, they can now draw in those customers. When you ban it outright, you eliminate one of the possibilities, a legal possibility that is, that is perfectly acceptable behavior for adults who enjoy that type of thing. And I think a ban is, is an overstepping of what should be allowed um, as far as controlling business. Obviously, uh, it passed, but it, well, my comment was basically about the, one of the ways that they're going to circumvent this, in addition to having smoking joints on, around the outskirts of town, is they're going to have memberships. And one of the places them, that I frequent on occasion has decided that instead of having membership, they're just going to have a, uh, a slightly higher fee and, uh, for the service and let you smoke. And any time that they get caught or want to you know, get a ticket or whatever, then they'll use that extra money fund just to pay off the ticket and ignore the law. I, oh. I understand people who want to breathe clean air and want to go out and enjoy things, but um, there's no, I mean, th there are we limits to We don't have to poison to ourselves to hear live music. Is that your point? Well, that depends. Somebody could organize a live music concert that was completely smoke-free if they so choose without having to ban the possibility of having a live music concert that allowed people to smoke. To me, it's an overextension of my opinion or somebody's opinion being forced upon somebody else. Um, if there's a market 
if there's enough people who want to breathe clean air, and evidently there are since they voted for a smoking ban, then there should be a market in an in in, in open system uh, to allow both cases. Well, I just, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to go out and hear live music again because the smoke bothers my allergies physically. Yeah, and I, and I understand that. I think I, I, it's not that I, I'm against you or your position of wanting to breathe, breathe clean air. It's, um, I think that this was all handled poorly. I think if people who wanted to, to do the things that you're enjoying doing, like you know, going to hear live music without having to be flooded out by smoke, and I, I don't smoke anymore. I haven't smoked in, I don't know, seven, eight months. If you can accomplish a goal without legislation, yeah. go that route. Yeah, if, if there were enough people saying, behavior. this is what we want, you know, we are your market, let's start doing this, then, and I would even possibly favor, and I don't want to get off on too much political stuff, but I would even possibly favor, like, incentives for for businesses who uh, took the risk, rolled the dice, and said, you know, we're going to we're gonna try this no-smoking thing and hope that there are enough people who would be interested in coming to a no-smoking club or, or whatever um, and offer some kind of tax break for them over the first couple of years while this is starting out to kind of, you know, we've, we've established a trend over many years of, you know, you can smoke all over the place, and to break away from that trend it might need some encouragement. It might need vocal people um, like you and like the people who voted for the ban. Uh, it's just my personal opinion. I think the ban is, is kind of overreaching uh, what should be allowed. Well, I guess I'll just have to go out and hear live music while I can until the club owners figure out ways to get around the law. Well, it, it, the thing is, is that... The ban may actually work out to be a good thing, even if it's later overturned, even if they find ways around it, um, because... Businesses will see that they were able to be successful even without smoking. Yeah, they'll see they that, that, that your market actually exists and is and is a valid market. Yeah, and I got to sit in the back room of the Texas Chili Parlor with the beautiful mural for the first time in years. It was great. Thanks a lot for calling. Right. Anyway, Thanks. have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Have a good day, Mary. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't expect to have to go down that road on the show because we've had discussions there. By the way, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the ACA when I yeah. state my opinion uh, about the smoking ban because there there are ACA members who are for the smoking. Matt ban. and I are on the same side and have been in rooms where everyone else was against us. Yeah, and and you know I I understand both sides of the issue. I, or at least I try to, um, having you know smoked for many years and and now not smoking. Um, but I think that's one of the things that, that's. Um, at least common, maybe not with all atheists, but with a lot of the atheists in the ACA and, and people who are active um, on behalf of atheism, is that we don't mind actually sitting around discussing things and looking at it from both sides. Um, and quite honestly, as somebody who was a Christian for 20 some odd years as well, that's what is primarily responsible for my being an atheist today, is that I, I decided I was unfairly um, setting my religious beliefs up in a little a safety zone where they were they were beyond questioning, but everything else could be questioned. And you're an atheist. For, you were a Christian for 20 years, and now you're an atheist. How'd that happen? Well, Anyone uh, line three wants to know. Uh-oh. Ah, cool. So we'll go on to line three. How you doing, William? Hi, how's it going? Pretty good. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious on, you know, how you made that transition and what led you into atheism? And what a coincidence that you... <laughs> yeah, that you're going to lead into that anyway, I guess. That's yeah. kind of uh, to find out. It's, uh, the, the short version is that there, there was no one thing. There was no one argument. Um, there was a, a period of time. Um, I was raised in a rather conventional Southern Baptist home. My, uh, my parents are still... Uh, believers, my brother. Actually, I'm probably the only atheist, or at least the only one I know of in the family. Um, as a, in, the, in my teen years, I was extremely active in the church, um, not just w with regard to attendance on Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you know, Monday night visitation, Tuesday night youth group, all of that stuff. But I was actually active with regard to ministry opportunities, um, and I at the time thought that I would go to school, go to seminary, and become a preacher. Um, the, the Things didn't quite work out that way. The money wasn't there, and uh, I had uh, slept through part of high school, so I really wasn't in the, in the right position to get a scholarship. In any wow. case, I, I ended up uh, joining the Navy. I was in the Navy for eight years, and 
I was somewhat religious during that time and somewhat not religious during that time. After I got out of the Navy, I decided, okay, now's the time. Um, semen in the Navy. Sorry? Those semen in the Navy. Uh, yeah. But uh, now's the time after I'm out of the Navy to get back on track to possibly going to seminary and becoming a, a minister. So I began to, you know, but I had doubts about my faith. You know, I hadn't been in, in church very often and, and was was kind of a, a, a backslidden Christian, I guess is what most of them would call it. Um, so I began to, to study things over a period of two or three years um, to bolster my faith, to answer those tough questions, you know. And I don't mean necessarily tough questions like, did Adam have a belly button? But, you know, more about uh, the validity of, of the Christian position and... Um, you know, how do we know what we know and, wh and whether or not it's true with regard to Christianity? What are those claims? Um, and it's through that process of studying that uh, it, I just got to the point where I pretty much shot apart everything about that I used to believe and a number of other things. Um, and after that, I was an atheist. So do you think any of those Navy seamen influenced you to be an atheist? No. Oh. You said you were involved in activities with your church. You said you were very active. What kind of activities? Um, in addition to the normal things, we did outreach programs, visitations to, to go out. And, and whenever somebody shows up in church and signs one of those visitors' cards, like on Mondays, we would go out and go to their home and talk to them about possibly joining the church, witnessing opportunities. Um, there were periods of time where we would go to camp and, and youth activities and rebuilding poor churches in, in other towns, stuff like that. Oh, thank you so much. You've been so helpful. Thanks. Thanks. Um, let's go on to Drew. How you doing? Hello. Howdy, Drew. Hi, Matt. Um, I know Mr. Bald, uh, Baldwin. Cool. How's uh, that going for you? Do you think that has anything to do with our intelligence? I would think so. Because Absolutely. I've noticed that a lot of smart people are bald. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot as to whether or not... I think what it is is there's so much activity going on that it's drawing energy away from hair follicles. <laughs> really? Hello? Yeah, you're still there. I haven't Plus, it's not a yet. bright idea to waste your money on uh, anti-balding products that are really... Yeah. Let's use your money for that. Did you have a question other than about uh, hair loss? Well, um, belief. I'm sorry? Belief. What about I, belief? You say you believe. I say I know. You say you know. Yeah. You know what? You, what, I, know, what? I know, like, I'm a Christian. Okay. Well, okay. You know you're a Christian. That, that's fine. Now we know it, too. What is it you claim to know apart from you're a Christian? Well, I know that you can't know. Thanks for calling. <laughs> uh, I uh, guess he has a big head of hair. He might. He might. Yeah. If if my theory holds true, I bet he's not bald yet. Jay, you're on the air. Hi. I just noticed that night on TV that one of the curriculum towards a college that was in the Northeast, a smaller one, they were going to make it be compelling to take a course on religion. And a lot of them were raising, you know, in opposition to it. And, and I said, just like this lady that was talking about smoking, we, the owners of any business, and you as a student, if you pay for something, you should not have to be compelled to take a course if you don't want it if it does not reflect against whatever degree you're going after. Now, people that had owned businesses a long time ago first, it was a racial issue. You had to serve people of different races. You couldn't discriminate against a black person if you didn't want them in that way. They had to be served. Even though it was your business, you wanted them. This is the same thing that came up with Proposition, what was it, two? Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Okay. I'm gay. Old man. I don't have any children. Never had them. I'm 75 years old, and I have had to pay school taxes. God, ever since I've been about 32 years old. Right. I don't have kids. But yet, I don't have a right to say 
really anything to do with my own personal life because it's a religious form of saying God says men takes a wife. Going back and reading in the older, older Bible, of one that I've seen that was a, I don't know when it was, it's a real big and thick thing, and it was a, uh, handed down many, many years through each one of his family, and it was a Bible that was been considered worth at least $65,000. He never would sell it. The word in, in the Greek uh, saying, a man shall accept a mate, not wife. There's a lot. There's a lot of issues and, like that with the Bible, where, where depending on which translation and and how you want to translate, um, you could end up with a completely different meaning. Okay. We, you know, the, the the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we have a hard enough time, and, and I hate to use this example because it's only partially true. Fully understanding everything Shakespeare said just a couple hundred years ago. I know I hate Shakespeare. <laughs> That, you know, to where now you've got the, the problem not only of a, th of, of a couple thousand years and uh, copies of translations of copies to try and find out, uh, you know, the original meaning, which could have been, you know, we can come close in some areas, but there's always going to be mistakes, which is why a lot of the people who try to claim, you know, uh, a perfect literal uh, word of God uh, don't have a leg to stand on. But and even who cares? Like, why should we be making laws based on this book, the Bible? Yeah. That's what, yeah. This is something that, well, it's not only, it's all the way through our whole life. And this is what, another thing I was sitting there thinking. There's someone else brought up about Catholics. Only the Pope, if you divorce, only the Pope can grant you the legal separation. So even if you get a divorce and you're Catholic, it said one man, one woman. If you remarry, that's the second wife or the second husband. That's illegal as hell in their religion, but they do it. Now, my question goes back to this. What if every gay in this country stood up and says, I am not going to pay city taxes. You discriminate against me because you don't give me the legal right to have a person of the same sex be a co-owner of my property. It's legally. I know I've gone through some stuff with power attorney, medical power attorneys. Hospital said it's just a piece of blank to blank paper. Also, if we withheld our school taxes, you discriminate against, really, they holler, you know, they don't want you on there. They don't want you as a teacher. And it's been proven. So of all these laws that are made now by the state, and we said, okay, we're going to file a lawsuit, stick together, withhold our school taxes, our city taxes. How much do you think that all the gay people that went together, that had the guts enough to do it instead of going into the closet and hiding who they are, come back and say, we're going to bring this lawsuit. What would it do to the economy of all of our systems if we would tell them and say, you're discriminating against us because you're not giving us, and it is a discriminatory yeah, I have I have no idea. I'm gonna th thanks a lot for calling. We'll try and answer this off the air and get on to some other callers. Thanks, Jay. I have no idea what exactly the impact might be actually or how much you could get this. Okay, it would be in the range of ten to fifteen percent of the taxes for uh, property taxes. Yeah, basically. unfortunately, it would be difficult to to get that. Get yeah, everyone you know, activated everybody together. Active, yeah. Actually, uh, this past uh, week, uh, last Tuesday, in the. Uh, Texas State University Star, I attacked uh, the issue of Proposition 2 from a secular standpoint of a religion separation of church and state issue, and uh, they printed the opinion piece, and uh, uh, unfortunately it didn't have much effect on the outcome, but um, it was fairly well received, and uh, if you want to look at that at the University Star website, you can uh, check that out. Um, under the opinion columns from last <coughs> Tuesday, I believe that was the uh, Eighth, but uh, yeah, okay. it's a really an issue. You know, separation of church and state. Where you know, it's there's no reason for it. There's uh, yeah, there's, I have yet. Yeah, we talked about last week. Benefit. Yeah, we, we, we talked about last week, week when Don was on. Uh, I don't know of any in, any good secular argument against gay marriage or, or any other uh, rights um, issues like that. They all seem to stem from a religious belief of, of one sort or another. And it, I, I think that what you'll see is, I don't ever see 
uh, much in the same way that I don't ever think we'll unite all atheists under one common banner for any anything. I don't think you would you would ever actually be able to unite all gays under one banner for for. Because there's some people that are uncomfortable with it. There's plenty of atheists who don't use the term atheist, just like there are gays who are in the closet. Um, but what I do think you'll see is lawsuits challenging. Um, a lot of civil rights issues, um, challenging this new amendment uh, and and nationwide amendments um, with regard to what we can and can't do. Um, you know what rights of of you know and of atheists, homosexuals, whatever particular minority you're talking about, are being unfairly discriminated against just because there happen to be a majority who believe one philosophy. So, uh, having said that, we'll go on to Gary. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Good show. Pretty good. Thanks. Thank you. You're, you're completely uh, missing the point of the, uh, the I, I hate to beat up on this topic, but the smoking ban. Okay. It's a public health issue. That's a lot. All right. For the same reasons that the inspectors go in and make sure your kitchen is clean, make sure your toilets are clean, make sure nobody urinates on the street. It's a public health issue. That's all it comes down to. I, I've, I've heard that. It's nothing to do with free choice. I, I understand uh, that. My, my answer to that is that if it were really a public health issue, there would not be so many exceptions to the rule. For instance, you know, here's a garage mechanic who's working on my car, and I'm, I'm allowed back into the shop to, so that he can explain what's going on with it. He is legally allowed to smoke there. They make exceptions for elderly. They make exceptions for all kinds of things. If it's a public health issue, then it should be cons you know, a matter for all public and well, if that's I, I, the, if that's the case, you, then it's, it's one the ban should be time, smoking. It? What's sorry? It's one, it, I, I agree with you uh, that there's too many exceptions to the law, but it's one step at a time. I well, mean, uh, smoking is is a horrible corporate disease. There's also there's also a matter of personal rights, and if I choose to slowly kill myself by inhaling carbon monoxide for thirty years, I should have that right. Yes, but at the same time, if you choose to go and urinate, urinate in the curb, you're going to get busted. It's a public health issue. You have the right to do whatever you want. There's but another, there's another business, issue with have actually... To go by the health laws. I understand. At the same time, you just like the guy who runs a restaurant, if he doesn't have a clean kitchen and the public gets sick in his, in his kitchen, just like when they're breathing the air in his restaurant, that's the whole issue. I, I disagree with your characterization that that's the whole issue. I do understand those parts of it. I think, for, for, for me personally, um, if it was just a public health issue, it, it would be a bit different. Um, there, there's also a matter of, of individual rights and what people can and can't do, and, and I think it goes beyond that. But I understand that, that framing of the issue. Uh, I just don't happen to agree with it. Yeah, okay, if you don't want to go to a topic. place that has a smoking in it, don't go. I mean, my, my father gets deathly ill of shellfish. He doesn't have to go to a clam bar. He can just stay away. Yeah, no, no one's forcing him to go. Yeah, I, you know, I can't say more than it being a public health issue. And the entire country is, is moving that way, as we know. You know, when little old Austin thought that, uh, boy, we, they're not going to do this to us. I mean, they've only done it in every major city in America. But us in Austin, we're going to stand up to it. Well, I mean... It's just not going to happen, guys. People right. are more concerned with their physical health these days. They want they want to breathe clean air, and uh, I mean, it ain't just it's just not coming back. Smoking will not return to us. Well, that depends because when you say it's a public health issue, one of the things that has to actually be demonstrated are that there are real tangible effects to secondhand smoke in the quantities that one can actually breathe them when they're out and about in the town, and that is something which is not definitively demonstrated. Oh, well, now you're, now you're going off onto a whole other argument, Matt, because, I mean, you're... If that's, you're, if you're that's the public health issue. Proof. Yeah, you have to have... No, evidence. I'm not. I'm saying, I'm, I'm actually, all right, I don't have the information here, so we'll have to stop on this, and maybe I'll actually uh, touch on this. It's way outside the scope of atheist issues. Um, if, you, if you get Showtime or pick it up on DVD, uh, Penn & Teller did a little expose about uh, the reliability of some, some secondhand smoke issues. Frank, it's it's way beyond the scope, and I think we talked about it too much. I, I disagree with it. I, I do understand your position, and hey, I can appreciate people who don't want to be around smoke and and take any risk with their health just because somebody's smoking. So on that, we and on that much, we definitely agree. Okay, well, let's keep back on topic. Thanks and a lot. It falls in the category of uh, factoids. Most people think of a factoid of just some odd fact, but actually what a factoid is is a piece of information that, though not validated or you know, proven to be true, gets repeated in the media and 
eventually everyone thinks it's true because it's been repeated so many times it's become a meme even though there's no evidence for it. A good example of this is that you should drink eight glasses of water every day. Um, there's no evidence for it. There's no studies on the benefits of drinking eight glasses of water every day. And probably more people die of uh, water poisoning, which actually happens as a result of doing this, than actually receive benefits from it. You actually get as much water as you need from the food that you eat than actually having any supplement. But it's a factoid out there that even without no evidence, without any evidence, people uh, keep on repeating. Yeah, there's a lot of others like that. Like, you know, the, the, the myth of a Christian nation. Yes, we live in a nation which is 75, 80% Christian. Um, but with regard to this nation being founded on Christianity and Christian principles, or primarily Christian, that myth gets blown way out of proportion and, and, and doesn't necessarily match with the facts at all. Um, nor, do, nor do I actually find it very relevant. Um, this nation could have been founded on, you know, uh, Buddhism, Sikhism, it doesn't matter. What matters is um, what's right, you know, what's, what is fair and just for all, and how much should, you, should somebody be allowed, or some group, regardless of whether or not they hold a ma majority, be allowed to, to infringe or limit the rights of others just because they happen to disagree on something. Um, and that's part of that. But we'll go on now to Bill. Yes. I'm sorry. You're going to have to turn your phone down. Quick, real quick. All right. I'm sorry. I'm not still there? Yes. Okay. I need to preface my argument with a brief quote, uh, and I want you to tell me what it means after I finish telling you. It's from John. It says, Our ideas have, however, the unfortunate but inevitable tendency to lie behind the changes in the total institution, and they can hardly do otherwise because so long as nothing changes in the world, they remain more or less adapted and therefore function in a satisfactory way. There has been no cogent reason why they should be changed and adapted anew. Only when conditions have altered so drastically that there is an unendurable rift between the outer situation and our ideas now become antiquated does the general form of our Welshian stog or philosophy of life arise and with the question of how the primordial images that maintain the flow of instructive energy are then to be reinvigorated and adapted. However... Uh, okay, that's, that's long enough. <laughs> uh, that's not the question that was up on the prompter, and I, I really couldn't possibly listen to a lengthy thing and give you my analysis of what I think it means. Uh, send it to me in email if you, if you want an answer on what my position is on something. Yeah. Um, that was supposed to be somebody asking why there aren't any atheist relief organizations. And if that actually was your question that you were going to get to after whatever sermon you were delivering, um, the fact of the matter is that there are atheist relief organizations. Um, why are there not as many? Well, there's not as many atheists for one thing. And the other thing is is that um, it, it, you have to realize that a lot of this is relatively new, being... Um, You've had thousands of years of not only rich churches, but huge church influence with regard to politics. They've built up this um, area of, of uh, charities and, and relief funds and things. And in general, they can be good at it, although how much overhead is involved and how much money actually ends up going to those who need it varies from charity to charity. Um, you can look into SHARE, which I believe is Secular Humanist Aid and Relief. Um, I think effort. it's yeah, Aid and Relief Effort, I think. Um, there are a number of other secular charities. And the other thing is, is that a lot of people, when they donate... Um, Go. To, they they tend to go to you know the most popular. They, I don't necessarily look for. Let me find a secular organization to get my money to the people in need after Katrina. Um, mostly, it's let me you know donate at the Seven Eleven or wherever the collection bucket happens to be passed. And if that happens to get filtered through some religious organization, I don't really care as long as the the end is that the, those people are actually getting the money. Um, when we were donating here for Katrina and asking people to help, uh, we actually went through the, uh, one of the groups was the um, Salvation, Salvation Army. Army because they're the per group that had the best plan and were uh, best at doing it in that situation. Yeah, we were collecting food stuff and, and, and items and not necessarily cash. I, the Red Cross is, depending on, on what you're talking about with, relate, with, with relation to, to uh, relief, uh, is one a, a fairly secular organization. There's not 
the Salvation Army isn't, but the Red Cross is with regard to you know what they're actually doing. There's no baggage that necessarily comes along um, with the Red Cross uh, with regard to proselytizing or anything else. So we'll move on. And Chris, you're on the air. Hi, thanks a lot. You guys do a great show. I uh, watch all the time, and I've uh, checked out your website and everything else. One one thing, though, that really has bothered me over the uh, the years about the show, uh, I'm an atheist-friendly uh, person, and uh, I, I, there's just a lot of guys that call in that do stupid things, like they'll make a comment about how you look or this or that. Or, and I was, just, I was talking to the screener here about um, why not put up their names and numbers on the screen <laughs> and just... If they're going to do something stupid, if they're going to be sophomoric, uh, just go ahead and, and bust them on it and have people calling them 30, 40 times after that saying, hey, how are you doing? Blah, 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 you know. I, I can definitely appreciate it, and we've talked about a lot of options. Um, I, I don't think I would actually ever do that. I don't even know it's if it would be legal. too much work and effort on our part. I, I, yeah, it's mostly it's just easier to hang up on them, and if, if you call back in, that's fine. But the, for the people who think that they're, they're calling in and you know talking about, oh, you're bald or you're fat or you're ugly or whatever else, I don't care. Um, if w what you think of me means so much less than you think it does. And I'm much more concerned that what I say um, and what we on the show get across when we're talking about real issues, real questions around atheism, theism, and things like that, that that word gets out to anybody who's willing to actually listen and consider the, the options. And that those people could care less, you know, whether somebody calls in, hey, I am going bald. Who cares? Oh, this is a great show, by the way. Um, I'm just wondering on a personal, well, I've, I've often looked at your forearm and tried to figure out what that tattoo is. <laughs> I, that, uh, it's crossed anchors. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, right. Mil uh, um, yeah, I, was in the, I was in the Navy for a little over eight years. Gotcha. Okay, great show, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right. See, Tim's here so that at least one of us isn't bald or overweight. Oh, um, we th fix things at the wedding, but you know it's eventually going to happen to me. No, I, I it, it doesn't really matter, and I don't know if there's anything we can actually do to to truly prevent it. Um, we're looking into options, but you know, hey, if, if you want to call and be an idiot, yeah, if you get your, I don't know, if you enjoy that, feel free. Um, I can hang up pretty quick usually. And Tina, you're on the air. Hi, uh, I recently called in with uh, Ashley Perrion. It was probably about maybe two or three months ago when he was still on, and we had a discussion about uh, evolution. And I'm looking at these facts from like I don't I don't know exactly what it's from. It's like atheistinformation or something dot com, and it says, "Did we evolve from monkeys?" Now, what it says on this website it says, "Humans did evolve from monkeys. Humans are more closely related to monkeys." Well, we didn't evolve from African mongooses. So, what do you know anything on this? Yeah, well, I can. I can yeah, this. So I, I, I study biology. That's what I'm getting my degree in. I would say right off that the statement is wrong, where they say yeah. humans evolved from monkeys. It portrays the, the wrong information. The recent, most recent ancestor that we have, going back about seven million years, is also the most recent ancestor seven million years ago with chimpanzees. And Wait, if you go so back 25,000 years... Is it a chimpanzee? No. And Tim will give you the answer, and you can visit that site for better information. Okay. None of the animals, or very few animals, are in the same form that they were 7 million years ago, because evolution didn't stop. It continues to go on. If you go back to where we are most closely linked to another animal that is current, it is that... Uh, chimpanzees, which share 98% of our DNA with us, 7 million years ago was when our closest ancestor was the same animal. And through variation, drifted apart to, there's a 2.2% 2. 2 difference between us now. That ancestor was not a chimpanzee. It was a slightly different animal that was, it was its own species. That species had drifts, alterations, mutations, um, selective uh, pressures of the environment and natural selection and sexual selection cause the current animals to exist. And that's what we have today. So chimpanzees are our most closely related animal that exists today, but 
neither humans or chimpanzees as we know them now existed seven million years ago when they linked up. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. It, you, you read that type of statement a lot where it's mischaracterized that humans evolved from apes, and, and, the, and the, the, the more accurate statement is that human and apes, sh apes share a common ancestor. Um, so we'll go on to Jason. You're on the air. Hi there, guys. Hey. I uh, just want to say I enjoy the show, and I actually do have a real question. Um, Thanks. <laughs> on both counts. Well, uh, you have a lot of questions, you know, dealing with general issues about atheism and atheism's relationship to religions. Um, but I, I, mean, I realize that on the show every day, I mean, every, every time you'll come on, come on uh, you'll make the announcement that the ACA is a group promoting positive atheism. And uh, to my knowledge, that's never really been defined. And I was wondering if you could define that, go over it, and uh, tell us a little bit about how that yeah. functions in relation to other types of atheism. And this is this is actually it's not a I, I wouldn't really consider it a type of atheism. It's it's a stance on on how you want to portray atheism. There was some discussion about this because there there are some people who who would use the term positive atheism to represent the uh, strong atheist argument that there is no God. Um, my understanding f from from our, our charter is that that's not uh, in any way what we mean when we're talking about positive atheism. It's yeah, my, mostly... My, sorry. My, my studies on positive atheism have shown that, yeah, it tends to argue that believers, that, that y'all assume that believers have a good reason to believe what y we believe. And... Uh, don't take that hardline stance, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't mean that we're arguing the affirmative. It's that we're showing the community that atheism is a positive thing, that atheists are involved with positive issues, that we're right. um, oh. dispelling active. some of the negative perceptions. Because what comes out of a lot of pulpits, especially like when I, when I was uh, in church a lot, is uh, a lot of misperceptions and half-truths and, and outlandish lies with regard to atheism and what atheist is. That, you know, without God there can be no morals. So atheists are all immoral, evil, um, trying to take over the world and, and destroy religion and get rid of God and make sure that nobody can worship. And the fact of the matter is that atheists generally are some of the biggest champions for freedom of religion um, in the country because freedom of religion when exercised properly means that everybody's believe is, is free to believe whatever they choose including nothing at all with regard to God good answers um, well thank you very much thanks a lot thank all right. you. we want to hit a couple news items real quick yeah let's see I got uh, let's go for Pat Roberts I like yeah I like picking on him <laughs> um, tar easy target we had elections this week, or this past week, um, and in Dover, Pennsylvania, where there is a court case going on, all eight school board members who were up for re-election were defeated after they tried to in introduce intelligent design, the belief that the universe is so complex that it must have been created by a higher power, otherwise known as creationism, as an alternative to the theory of evolution. Pat Robertson, on his 700 Club uh, television program, said... Quote, I'd like to say to the good citizens of Dover, if there's a disaster in your area, don't turn to God. You just rejected him from your city. God is tolerant and loving, but we can't keep sticking our finger in his eye forever. If they have future problems in Dover, I recommend they call on Charles Darwin. Maybe he can help. Them. And um, I'd like to say to, to Brother Pat that I'd bet that if they pray to Darwin they get roughly similar results. This concept that intelligent design is not in any way linked to uh, conservative Christian movements is absurd. While there are some people who push intelligent design um, as a, this isn't tied to any particular religious belief, each of them when pressed to say, well, who do you think the designer is? tend to come up with the same or similar answers. This is creationism in disguise, and when Pat Robertson talks about them ejecting God, he's not, uh, he is in, in, infusing over the top of intelligent design his view of God. Um, and by, re, you know, it's, ugh. If he likes that logic, from now on, whenever his body begins to fail due to age, he shouldn't be allowed, he should only be allowed to pray 
and not to make any use of uh, modern medicine. Because if you're gonna, if you're gonna just you know flat out deny science and and uh, and say that the the mere rejection of some school board members uh, diffuses any chance of religion uh, in Dover, well, you're a moron. Yeah. But uh, hey, and what do we do after the show today? We uh, go to uh, it's Fresh Choice today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They could have put up a reminder. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. For those of you who, uh, who have called and who haven't called yet or are watching, um, after the show, we're going to Fresh Choice on Great Hills Trail near the Arboretum, and in, any atheist or atheist-friendly people are welcome to join us. The show goes off the air at six o'clock, and we normally get there between six thirty and six forty-five. It's a chance to meet the cast and crew, and there's a lot better people on that side of the camera that you should get a chance to meet as well. Um, so come on down and join us. This will be the last time we're meeting at Fresh Choice for right. until again. Next week we'll be going to Mongolian, Mongolian Barbecue downtown. Wherever that is, downtown. Um, so that's enough of Pat Robertson because I can I think I can only stomach one Pat Robertson article a week. Um, we'll go on to a couple more callers. We got Jason. Hello. Is this this isn't Jason, is it? No, it's not. It's Kevin. Well, how you doing, Kevin? Great. How are you? Pretty good. What do you want to talk awesome. about? Uh, I, I also, uh, I am also an atheist, but uh, I have a question about the actual name of your, uh, your organization, Atheist Experience. That's the name of the television show. I mean, uh, experience is pretty much derived with values. I'm telling you, this is like more an ethical question. But atheism, isn't atheism a question of metaphysics? Uh, because I, I, the reason I ask is I know many atheists who are pro-logic, pro-reason, but many of them are also... Uh, ardent altruists uh, versus individualists, and you know, it seems like there's a huge spectrum. And uh, for an atheist experience, I just don't understand when exactly the atheist uh, experience is only the name of the TV show. It's um, clever. That's it's it. catchy. Basically, it's it's there to say this is a look into the experience of atheists, our lives, um, and putting a public face on it. The, the organization is just the atheist community of Austin. Right, but but we talk about experience, though. I mean, uh, are you saying that all atheists have the same kind of experience? No, no. no. Oh, so, so it's just an eclectic view then. Yeah. yeah. This is, it's just the name of the show. We're, we're here answering questions, and not every atheist um, necessarily agrees with everything that I say. Right. There, there are atheists sitting in this room who aren't going to agree with everything I say. Um, okay. I'm just answering questions as best I can, and, and as we mentioned with the previous caller, trying to put a positive view on things to dispel a lot of the myths. Because one thing which is true is that just because you are an atheist does not mean you are an immoral monster. Just like just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're a good person. Right. Um, there is no connection between what you believe and what you do as far as a, a strict cause and effect relationship. Um, because we're all humans. We're all, we all, we're all prone to mistakes. We all uh, tend to tend towards selfish behavior at times and, and other times we can be altruistic. Um, all right, what? I'm sorry, did you say there's no cause between what, you're, what you believe and what you do? There's not, you can't make a, a, a unanimous declaration of cause and effect relationship between what you profess to believe and what your actual actions are in, 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 in the large scale sense. You can't say. Consistency. Just because you believe, yes. you, you, just because you believe like other Christians do, doesn't mean you behave the same way. The same is true for atheism. It, right. You can't make those kind of global generalizations. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for calling. Take care. We've got uh, on line one, Abdul. How you doing? Oh, good day. How are you doing? Pretty good. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Hinduism and uh, your beliefs in evolution. And uh, you said that you did not believe in the monkeys, and we believe that we come from elephants. It you're, is. you're entitled to that belief uh, if it, that's what you believe. Um, I think the, the the DNA would kind of refute whether or not yeah, we have a common ancestor. The most common ancestor with, with elephants goes back about 120 million years, and uh, there's a on, on some level, you know, you share DNA with every other living thing on the planet, including a, a tree or a carrot. So yeah, uh, we'll go on, and we've got Maggie. How you doing? Hi, uh, I have a question. Okay. Who or what do you turn to when a loved one is very ill or that you have a, a major problem? And I mean, because I know that I turn to God and I start praying, but who or what do you turn to when you've got a major problem and you don't know what to do about it? Who are you asking? Or? You, Matt. Okay. 
Um, myself? Yes. Th that's the answer. I turn to myself. I turn to my friends and family. Um, I don't feel any need or, or uh, compulsion to throw out arbitrary pleas to some potential mythical figure in the sky. Okay. Uh, when things get tough, I rely on myself as best I can and others who are willing to help. What about, do you, what do you think about ghosts when people, you know, somebody dies and they're like earthbound, you know? I, I don't believe don't in believe ghosts. It. No, how do you explain what people see sometimes? In people see a great many things, and the brain is a very complex uh, thing, and, and there's also, you know, you've got, uh, your eyes can play tricks on you, your mind doesn't always process things correctly, you've got sleep deprivation, food deprivation, hallucinogenics, any number of things, plus the simple fact, and, and this comes from many years of, of being an amateur magician, you don't always see what you think you see. Um, people, we're, we're very easily fooled, and eyewitness testimony is notoriously horrible with regard to accuracy. Our what? ability to perceive the world is not very successful. I mean, if you think about how atoms work, if you think of a, 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 a diamond, diamond, the most uh, hardest substance that we know of, the individual atoms of a diamond are on scale football fields lengths apart from each other. Most of the world is empty space, but we don't perceive it as empty space because that doesn't work well for us. But we don't perceive the world accurately as it is. And as a result, um, a lot of things get by us and deceive us and get out of the corner of our eyes. And, uh, you know, there's most of these things. If you go to the James Randi site, it's a great place to see how people accidentally see the wrong thing. And uh, we... You know, that's the explanation. There's always another explanation that's the true one as opposed to what a ghost is. Yeah, just just for clarity, I don't deny. I, if somebody says they saw a ghost, I believe that they believe it. Mm -hmm. Just as if somebody says they believe in God, I believe that they believe in God. I, but that doesn't mean that I also believe in God or that I also believe in ghosts. It, it, it's, we establish in our minds a, a standard of evidence that's required, and each claim, based on what kind of claim it is and how, how believable it is at face value, um, requires a different amount of evidence. If somebody comes up and says, I have a pet dog, well, even if I don't know them, I'm probably safe in accepting their claim at face value because I know that dogs exist. I know that they're often kept as pets. Um, I've, I've had pet dogs myself, and I don't have any reason to believe this person's lying. Additionally, accepting that claim doesn't change my worldview at all. I'm not required to automatically accept other things with the same standard of evidence. Okay. If somebody says, I've got a pet dragon, well, now you've got a whole different type of claim, mm -hmm. and it's going to require a whole different type of evidence, or at least a different amount of evidence, and, and with some regard, quality as well. Um. What, what do you think happens to a person when they die, except, like, for you, for instance? What do you think happens, what's going to happen? I mean, some people think they're going to go to heaven or what have you. And I'm, uh, I'll be dead. End game. Okay. And what, uh, I guess the, when people fall, see the tunnel and the light, that falls under the same conception as uh, people that believe in the ghost, right? I, I think that in general it does, and one of the reasons that, that I tend to do, I tend to think that way, um, is because... People always seem to have religious experience that exactly coordinate with their previous held beliefs. Christians don't see Buddha. Um, you know, Hindus don't see Jesus. They see things that match their preconceived notions, which indicates that it's most likely just the brain's way of, of, of handling the situation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to become a... I mean, I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. but I, I don't want to not believe, you know, and when I have a problem, because I, so I have depression really bad, or I'm getting better, but I tend to, when I'm in, in trouble, I kind of tend to pray to God, you know, and then at some times I'm thinking, the Bible is such, so, it seems like a fairy tale, you know, with Adam and Eve and all that. Yes, I, I'd agree with you there, yeah. and, and I can definitely understand, you know, as, as somebody who was a Christian for many years, um, th there's a, it's, it's hard to break out of, of even once you start deconstructing the religion and evaluating individual claims, like, you know, how absurd is the flood and the 180 years between the flood and Tower of Babel and the population explosion and how reliable is that and what do we really know about the Bible? I mean, we don't know who very many of the authors were despite the names which the church later added to it. So you've got this big mess 
of outlandish claims for which there is no reliable evidence. But yet, because we uh, are often raised with a particular belief, it's very difficult to, to detach yourself enough to say, you know, none of this really makes sense to me. I don't even think I believe it anymore. And yet I'm still just going to cry out to God in my time of need because I don't know what else to do. And um, I don't have a really great answer to that. It's a matter of strengthening um, your reliance upon reality, what you, what you can see, what you can handle, you know, and, and building up a way to um, not only assess what's real in much the same way that you would when deconstructing religious beliefs, but also of establishing ways for you to handle situations. And you may have to rely on other people around you, you know, during a transitional time. Or you could just, you know, all of a sudden wake up one day and go, you know, hey, I don't need to do that anymore. When was the last time it actually helped me in any real way to say, oh, God, help? Um, how is it, you know, what, if there is no God, how is that any different than saying, oh, let me think for a second? Because <laughs> that's what you're doing. You're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I fully admit that you can have real physical calming effects in prayer, but it's not anything that's any, that, that is any different from meditation or taking a deep breath or relaxing. Um, the, the concept that this, there's also this added experience of a supernatural being, it's kind of wishful thinking. We, we count the hits and ignore the misses. You know, how many times how many, in a football game, both teams are praying that God's going to let them win. Only one of those teams is going to win. How many people on their yeah. deathbed yeah. are and I praying? Think with all prayer and a lot of stuff with religion, you know, if you ever watch a scary movie, take out the music from it. See if you can take the options out. It's, it's, you might be watching a scary movie. If you replay that movie without the music, and uh, all the effects of it and how that emotionally affects you, it's not scary anymore. It's just someone walking down the stairs. And uh, you don't hear the creaks of the staircase or anything. And one of the things with church and everything is you have all this pageantry to it, which is very attractive and uh, enjoyable for people. And, you know, when you have people that you're friends with and you know and you go to and it's part of your ritual, it's attractive. But once you take away the music and look at it uh, objectively, you know, you see that it's really not changing things. It's you're creating it in your mind, and you're uh, getting these uh, experiences, auxiliary experiences that are uh, not essential to what you're doing when you're actually praying or believing in God. That are reinforcing this uh, these thoughts that aren't definitely true. That's a yeah. That's a great example of that. Uh, just one real quick question, Matt. I know I'm taking long, but what if think about psychics? Um, I think they're all fakes. Okay. I think the overwhelming evidence is that they're all fakes. Any of them that would actually bother to be tested um, have proven to be uh, charlatans or completely unreliable. It's, it's true of a lot of things like that. The ones, the smart ones are the ones who don't, don't agree to be tested. Um, <laughs> and I also think that in many cases they are uh, Asshats, I guess, would be a good word because they're out there praying, uh, and that's ey, on people's grief and pain. And in some cases, yes, they'll tell them exactly what they need to hear to know that Johnny's up in heaven and and playing with Rex who died when he was three. Um, but that doesn't actually help the person cope in any real way. And in some cases, they actually do harm, financial harm. Uh, psychological harm. They take away, you know, people's ability to deal with reality by substituting this fiction, and they do it for their own profits. And I think it's despicable. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Thank bye. Yeah, you mentioned James Randi's site. Um, it's a lot of good information yeah. there about, and it's www.randi.org. Yeah. R A N D I. Yeah, it's uh, you know, you know, sometimes it's fun to go to a fortune teller or have someone read tarot cards to you. My brother does it all the time. It's just a, a fun hooting and holler, and you don't take it seriously. It's just an little escape thing for a little while, like yeah, watching a TV show. Yeah, it's a carnival. But if you go and invest all your money in something because you saw someone in the psychic, you know, read it off a tarot card, don't do it. Yeah, I think the it's, most the most common scam that they that they use is that you know you're you're 
the bad things that are happening to you are the result of some curse. And what we really need to do is for you to bring in a few hundred dollars, and I'll wrap it up in a napkin with a raw egg, and then I'll give it back to you. And you can't open it, but take it home and bury it in your backyard, and your troubles will be... Well, they switch the money while they're doing it, and they get to keep your money, and you go out and bury newspaper <laughs> clippings without ever opening it, because if you open it, the trouble gets worse. So it's... Didn't the uh, Smith of the Mormon religion run a similar scam when he started out? Well, no. I, I think you could make a claim that there was something similar. David was on a couple weeks ago talking about uh, them digging holes for treasure. and just, yeah. look, As long as you keep paying me, I'm going to keep digging this hole. The demons pulled it down deeper, so i got to dig deeper. you got to pay me to dig for another day. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's, it's one of the things, and I'm, I would never say that there are no good benefits uh, that you can achieve due to religion. My position is that all of those good benefits, the ones that are real, um, can be achieved without religion, without the extra baggage that goes along with it. Um, and I think that more often than not, uh, religion, psychics, uh, other claims end up being tools for profit, uh, power, uh, any number of other, you know, uh, motives that don't do as much for the end believer or uh, as, as simply learning to deal with the reality around you. Learn as much as you can, get knowledge about how things really work, and it can help you, you know, cope. Um, when, when I'm pulled over for speeding, I'm not praying to God that this cop behind me is going to be nice and not give me the ticket. I'm going to sit there and go, well, yeah, you shouldn't have been speeding. Maybe he'll give me a ticket, maybe he won't. I'll just cope with it regardless of what he does. You know, you got to suck it up and face the consequences. And I think religion kind of lets people out of the consequences in some cases. Um, and, and there's a, a news article where the, the Freedom From Religion Foundation filed a lawsuit Monday claiming um, the Life Principles Community slash Crossings program for women in prison had the intent of converting women to Christianity. Um, the Freedom from Religious Fo for Religion Foundation said that the content of the faith-based program provided by the Corrections Corporation of America is intended to convert people to fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity. The suit also claimed that women in the program received special treatment and better living conditions than other inmates, and that the state unlawfully uses taxpayer dollars to fund religious training. Um, I guarantee you there's going to be people saying, oh, they're coming and attacking our religion. Here we are trying to, to rehabilitate these, these poor women um, and turn, you know, let Jesus offer them a helping hand, and, and now they're coming after us saying we can't do it. No. If you want to proselytize, knock yourself out. You want to go tell women in prison about Jesus? Feel free. But you pay for it. You go and do it, and they don't get any special treatment just because they happen to come and listen to you. Um, it's... it's it's a violation of separation of church and state, and it's a misuse of my tax money. The thing you said before about the uh, with religion and uh, you know when you're praying and waiting for things to happen and uh, focusing away from the uh, consequences of events. If you really think about it, when you're praying and all this thing, you're focusing on the anticipation of things in life, and a lot of times, especially with bad things, the anticipation is worse than the actual thing itself. And when you're sitting there praying for something to go away, it's worse than actually when it happens and something bad happens to you. It's like, you know, the whole taking off the Band-Aid. If you just take the thing off and don't worry about it, you'll forget about it a couple minutes later and that's it. You know, uh, the anticipation of life and bad things can often be worse. And uh, oftentimes religion and praying is just a reinforcement of the negative anticipation. Yeah, definitely. Let's go on and uh, take some more callers. Uh, Sherry, you're on the air. Hello? Hello? Oh, oh uh, sorry. Uh, my son recently told me that he was an atheist, and I was just a little concerned because our family is uh, a, a traditional Catholic. And what really concerned me is when he went up to me and he had a tattoo. I, uh, I don't think that was Sherry. And uh, I don't think that actually was going to be what it was about. So uh, if it was, then I'll apologize for cutting you off, but I think I recognized your voice, yeah. and we, we've been uh, having a few calls today. 
So the, the question that was supposed to be asked, do we want to go ahead and handle that? How, how, the world, how did yeah. the world get here? Um, read uh, Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity and uh, study some uh, cosmology, and that's what, uh, that's what you need to learn to find out how, we, how the Earth got here. About four and a half billion years ago, the, you know, tons of matter came together and uh, formed due to gravitational forces, and... Uh, that's what we have as a result. It's a yeah, pretty the, awesome coincidence and uh, the, pretty uh, incredible. I guess, I guess the real answer, the most technically correct answer is we don't know. But we do have theories. We do have evidence, tested ideas. The Big Bang is, is, is as much settled science as evolution or gravity or anything else. And, you know, like a lot of the intelligent design folks try to, it's just a theory, this, this claim that it's just a theory. Um, Okay, why aren't you saying that about the things that, you know, you agree with and you enjoy it? Things that uh, help you out, but I've got uh, one more that relates to uh, intelligent design. All right. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth has waded indirectly into the evolution debate in the United States by saying that the universe was made by an intelligent project and criticizing those who, in the name of science, say its, relig its creation was without direction or order. This came just days after Cardinal Poupard stated that the intelligent design, that intelligent design and evolution were quote perfectly compatible if the Bible is read correctly. Um, so you got to kind of wonder: is the Pope coming out and discrediting his cardinal? Well, not really, um, because he's not actually saying anything with regard to evolution. He's only talking about. Uh, the pre-evolution abiogenesis, the cosmology, yeah. the Big Bang that would fall so, so under intelligent design. it would be unfair to call him a flip-flopper. Yeah. Uh, well, no, not this guy. <laughs> uh, one can only assume that he's speaking out against abiogenesis and not specifically evolution. Um, he quoted St. Basil the Great, a 4th century saint, saying that some people, quote, Fooled by the atheism that they carry inside of them, imagine the universe free of direction and order as if at the mercy of chance. The Pope said, how many of these people are there today? These people, fooled by atheism, believe and try to demonstrate that it's scientific to think that everything is free of direction and order. Um, no. No. The, I don't. I don't care. Science who is you the are. explanation of direction and order. It's not free of direction and order. First of all, it's intellectually dishonest to sit around and accept science with regard to evolution, gravity, medical science, and everything else, and then all of a sudden say, "Whoops, science can't answer this question. This question's off limits because as soon as you answer it, I'm screwed. I'm out of a job." <laughs> That's intellectually dishonest. The Pope is essentially saying, "When I look at the world, I see the marvel." the wonderful work of God. And you should see that too, or you're an idiot. Uh, sorry, I don't. Your Holiness, the truth is that one position is supported by interpreting observations based on pre-existing bias, and the other position is, support, is, is, is based on interpreting evidence according to the only demonstrable or reliable method for discerning reality, and that's science. And it's what gives you your medications it's what, you know, it defines the world around you in every sense except for the little niches that you've wanted to carve out for yourself. And, and I don't blame this all on you. You just stepped in to fill the shoes of all of the other popes and religious leaders who carved out that niche for you. I'm really sorry that reality doesn't happen to mesh with your beliefs. But the rational man, when faced with that dilemma, abandons and changes his beliefs. As soon as you find out that things that you believe don't mesh with reality, guess who's wrong? If anyone needs any evidence that preachers, popes, and pastors are just making this up as they go along, just compare the statements of one pope with another. These people cl claim to represent the moral absolutes of, um, of an omnipotent, omniscient, unchanging God, and yet, if based on what they, the words that come out of their mouth, God changes his mind every time he changes popes. Or underwear. It's this, this attack on intelligent design, uh, or this attack using intelligent design, which is creationism in a lab code, as, as uh, Russell calls it, is completely dishonest. They don't 
offer any evidence to support their claims or, or, or make any predictions at all. What they do is they rely on exploiting the general ignorance of the population and the intellectual integrity of scientists to say, yep, science doesn't absolutely know anything. It's all just probabilities and how likely something is. Um, and th they distort any possible little gap to say, whoa, science can't answer this. You know what? We don't have to have the answer to everything now. Maybe we'll never have the answer to everything. But of the answers we do have, the absolute most reliable always come from science. Never in the history of humans has science been up head-to-head -head in direct conflict against a religious idea, and the religious idea proves science wrong. It can't, it can't happen. Um, you would still need to resort to science, of course, to prove science wrong. But there's never been a case that even remotely comes close to that. I mean, the whole thing is evolution is taught in science classes, and science has a purpose. Science explains the universe and how uh, our world in it and how we uh, work with objects to manipulate them and manipulate the forces of the universe to accomplish things. It's useful to us. Intelligent design isn't useful to anyone. So what? Even if there was a creator, so what? How, does, how is that useful to us? How can you take that information and uh, create something out of it and manipulate the world for your betterment? You can't. It doesn't do you any good. The, you know, there's other examples of where we have competing theories that don't support each other, but in their different elements are useful. For instance, you have the, um, the flat earth theory. And actually in geometry, you're using the information of a flat plane. Well, that's how we build things. That's most of our archite architecture is based on that. But, you know, it's not the truth. It's not, you know, the true version of uh, what earth is. But it's useful to a certain extent. Uh, Newtonian physics are used to set all our satellites out in space. But that's not the absolute truth of uh, what the best theory for the explanation of how matter works is. The theory of relativity is more successful, is more succinct. But for the limited purposes of satellites, we can use Newtonian um, physics and it works just fine. The most important thing with science is that the theories that we use for are useful. Evolution is useful. People are... It's the basis for all modern biology. Yeah. You couldn't have any modern biology without evolution. We would only have half the people on this planet today that we would otherwise have if we weren't utilizing the theory of evolution. And Think evolutionary also goes into to things like um, uh, developing new pesticides for insects that rapidly evolve because their life cycles are so short. Um, yeah, it's 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 a non God is a non answer, and it, to find to start shoving your God concept into gaps in knowledge um, doesn't answer any questions, and all it does is impede the progress towards actually answering those questions with regard to reality. Uh, let's move on to some more callers. We got Daryl. How you doing? I'm doing fine. I just moved to Austin, and I come from this little small town. It's a really religious town, and I just moved here, and I just stumbled across your show, and I just wanted to say thank you for being on the air. Wow, it's just amazing to see something like this on television. I'm totally not used to this, and it's thank awesome. You. Welcome to we're town, and thanks it. for watching. You're welcome to join us at Fresh Choice, as are any atheist or atheist-friendly people after the program. Um, it's on Great Hills Trail next to the Arboretum. We get there between 630 and 645. How long have you been in Austin now? A week, not even. Wow. So this was actually your first possible chance to catch our show, and you did. Yes. Does that make you think that maybe there's a god who wanted you to watch the show? Uh, more like random chance. I would out. think so. Yeah. Maybe it's just that being new in town, you didn't have much to do on a Sunday, and we're channel flipping. Exactly. Well, we're really glad to have you watching, and... Um, like I said, you're welcome to join us after the show as well. Um, welcome to town. And, yeah, our show is its not unique. There are a few other atheist organizations who uh, who do television shows, but they're rare. It just totally blows my mind to see something like this on the air because I'm so used to having 15 Christian networks, Trinity Broadcasting and all those everywhere all over the network and signs and churches everywhere I go because it's a little small town in southeast Texas right in the edge of the Bible Belt. Yeah. 
Well, action. in fairness, there's several public access channels here, and one of them is completely devoted to religion. So at least we've I chipped mean, out our little corner of the of yeah, the public even access having, world. Just having this viewpoint out there is just amazing. Well, thanks right. a lot, and Thank keep you. watching, and feel free to call us anytime. Yeah. I will. And we'll and, see you sometime. Uh, we've got about a little over five minutes left. I'm going to try and get to a couple other callers real quick. We've got Greg. You're going to smoke dope. <laughs> Is that a prediction? And we've got James on the air. How you doing, guys? I'm enjoying the show. Uh, I'm a recovering Catholic uh, from the Northeast. I no longer change my popes, but I do try to change my underwear as often as possible. Uh, you got the Mormons yeah. beat. What's that? <laughs> You've got the Mormons beat. Okay. You have to wear their underwear in the shower, so. <laughs> I was just wondering if you guys were familiar with the book. It sounds like I'm pushing it, but I'm not. I just finished reading it. I found it interesting. It's called The End of Faith, subtitled Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason by Sam Harris. No, I'm not. Okay, interesting book. Uh, basically, uh, it, I, I read a review of it, actually, when I was back up uh, in the Northeast uh, just recently, where it was criticized as being you know, very atheistic, whereas these other books which are like, you know, that they were reviewing that were also similar as, you know, is God dead or is God alive sort of stuff, uh, came in. He, basically, his premise is that in light of 9-11, uh, what you have here is that there's a difference. He starts the book off describing, you know, the tale of a young man who gets on a bus and blows himself up. And, well, guess what? He's not a Jainist. What is he? He's, a, he's just an Islamic. Right. An Islamist. Uh, so I just it, I just think it's an interesting book. I'm just always curious if you'd read that or. No, I actually yeah. haven't read that yet, yeah. but I'll, I'll add it to the list. Uh, yeah. Interesting book, uh, but I basically agree with you guys. I consider myself to be agnostic. Um, I figure, you know. So do I. Yeah. Okay. Well, so the thing yeah. is, is that, uh, and, and this depends on what types of definitions you're going to use. Um, atheism and agnosticism aren't mutually exclusive. One re agnosticism and gnosticism refer to what you claim to know or be able to know. Right. And theism and atheism re refer to what you claim to believe. So there is a philosophical construct that would allow for agnostic atheists, agnostic theists, Gnostic atheists and Gnostic theists. I guess I so, the second category. Yeah, I, I would be an agnostic atheist because yeah, I too. don't absolutely know, but I don't have any belief in a god. And most of most of the atheists that I talk to, and most in the ACA, probably fall into yeah. that category as well. So, so the problem that I've had with like atheism, just like capital A atheism, is that it becomes almost religious for for some people. I'm not saying you guys, because you guys sound pretty reasonable. Well, I, although. I would fit that categorization. Um, I don't consider it a religion. Um, there is no dogma or tenet or ritual or That's anything good. else. But I'm definitely what would be considered, uh, in a rather humorous sense, an evangelical atheist in that I'm, well, I'm on a TV show and a radio show and I write a number of articles um, critical of various religions and various religious claims and um, favoring an atheist worldview. So in that sense... It's a, it's kind of a, an activist, activist philosophy, right. which I could see being confused for religion. The thing is, is that religion, in any sense, which is particularly meaningful, um, when we're not talking about nitpicking to, to define rights with regard to freedoms of religion, you're talking about a belief system, a structured um, kind of do list of do's and don'ts and Philosophical rituals. And, right. Yeah. Makes and that claims that can't mesh. be attained without the religion. Yeah. Right. Oh, thanks a lot for taking my call. Thanks for calling. All right. Thank you. we got about uh, two minutes left. If you didn't manage to get through on the phone, uh, you can email tv at atheist-community.org. It's up on your screen. You can visit the ACA website, www.atheist-community.org, which is right up there. Um, we are on live every Sunday from 4.30 to 6, and it's rebroadcast on Tuesdays. Um, feel free to call us. You can email and for any atheist and atheist friendly people, as we said, we're going to be going to Fresh Choice here shortly. Yeah. Tim, thanks for uh, stepping up and, and helping me out today. No problem. I enjoyed it. We had to do some last minute shuffling or last day shuffling. Yeah. I didn't have any notes. You did great. That's right. We had a good time. Um, thanks to all the callers and the cast and crew. And I don't know, we have any last minute news bits? We do have a caller, but the name hasn't come up yet. Want to risk it? Let's risk it. Oh, oh, oh even, you hung up. <laughs> See, and here I was going to let you, you know, get the okay. last word in and say whatever you wanted. You're on the air. Back to the yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and that's why we have a call screener. 
So just as a reminder, um, a lot of activities throughout the week. Uh, Monday nights is Godless Gamers. Tuesday nights, we're roller skating. Thursday nights, you can go to Atheist Happy Hour. Um, the information on all these are on the website. Uh, tune in again next week, and there'll be different hosts and co-hosts over here, and you can call in and, well, talk to them. Yeah. Thanks for watching.